Welcome to Bread and Roses, everyone. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Farid Bospuya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the Pakistani government's demand from Facebook and Twitter that they hand over information on those who've committed blasphemy and the fact that these groups are possibly contemplating doing that and the compliance of also BBC Asia Network asking, what is the punishment for blasphemy? We'll have an insane fatwa from Saudi Arabia on the Council of Girls led by all men and our slice of life is a wonderful 16 year old singer from Assam, India who is challenging uh, the demand of Islamists to stop singing. The interview this week is with Sadia Hamid on the launch of Critical Sisters. Stay with us, don't go away, you're going to love this program. The ridiculous Pakistani government has asked Facebook to give it information on those who have committed blasphemy in Pakistan or even abroad so that they can have them extradited. And the very fact that Facebook is even not saying that this is a ridiculous joke and even contemplating the possibility of discussing this issue with the Pakistani government is outrageous to and, say the least. And we've had this demand from various reactionary um, governments, uh, in particular from Middle East and Asia, we've had China restricting uh, mm -hmm. freedom of um, expression on the net. We've had Islamic Republic of Iran from yes. its inception has been trying to masculate freedom of expression mm -hmm. on the net and stopping um, and actually not giving license to cer mm -hmm. certain social media uh, networks. But people have gone beyond this. But the outrageous thing is that the Pakistani government dares publicly to talk about blasphemy, mm. dares publicly to talk about the, f the fact that people criticizing Islam and Islamists on the net, it's a crime um, and um, is roping in um, Facebook. But, and but also media it just shows how much the Islamist narrative has become normalized. You've got the BBC Asian Network, for example, discussing this issue. And their question is, what is the punishment for blasphemy? There's this underlying assumption that there needs to be a punishment because people's sentiments and, uh, you know, um, uh, ideas have been so harmed that it's contemplatable that there should be a sort of punishment. And that in of itself is the problem. And we've seen Facebook has collaborated on and on and on with repressive groups, you know, the censorship of atheist, uh, Arab atheist uh, sites, for example, Indian atheists, you've got Iranian atheists, you've seen Facebook do this on and on and on. Many times the Council of Ex-Muslims and the work that we've done has been censored, including by Twitter, you know, and you think it's it's yeah, become yeah. normalized yeah, to absolutely. a ridiculous if extent. You allow them, if you allow them actually to normalize the most oppressive and reactionary views, uh, BBC Asian, Network had to back off and apologize under pressure yeah. and protest and objection by uh, many people on the on, on Twitter and social media, and that's a that's a great achievement. But that is not this is not going to go away. This is a fight that must be won against the Pakistani government, against Facebook and social media organizations. Yeah. No censorship. There are attempts internationally to um, find various people. Or oh, these fake news, it's all of this. Of course, let's deal with that openly, expose them. This is an opportunity to expose the Pakistani government, it's in complicit activity with the Islamists, um, to expose Facebook and social media organizations things... to actually trying to, yeah. you know, trying to normalize yeah. the situation. But also, I mean, I think what uh, the very quick apology of BBC Asia Network showed is that it is possible to organize against these attempts at imposing blasphemy rules by making a big stink about it. I mean, just as BBC Asia Network was doing this, there's a 31-year-old Indian rationalist, H. Farooq, who was murdered because of his atheism, because of his rationalism and what he said on social media. So the 
Blasphemy laws have real consequences. It means that people can be killed in a place like Pakistan, in a place like Iran. It means that mobs, even in a country like India, which may not have blasphemy laws to that extent, can be just murdered on the street. Or you've got people being threatened here in Europe for the same reason. So it's really important to say no. Blasphemy is not a crime. It's a basic right. And the reality is that there is a huge demand for freedom of expression. Young generation are discussing various issues on a social uh, network and social media. And this is what they're scared of. Mm -hmm. The reactionary governments and the organization, Islamist and religious right, they're all are scared it's of this corruption, phenomenon. Corruption, corruption. Yeah, they're constantly talking about this. That's yeah. the only way they have. This actually shows that the strength and the extent and the growth of the young generation who want to freely discuss um, ideas, science, art, you know, social um, ills and issues, it's so great that they are trying to uh, this is the last bastion for yeah. them actually to, yeah. to, to come and attack and we need to protect it and it's right for us to condemn uh, as we did uh, Asian BBC Asian Network and any other organization and government who try to limit freedom of expression. launch of a new campaign, Critical Sisters, I spoke to Sadia Hamid, who is one of the founders of this group. And it's basically a group that challenges religious and other anti-feminist norms from a left perspective. It says, you know, you expect an attack on women's rights from the right. But Nowadays, you find very often the left is also supporting regression against, you know, women's rights. And so they've established something where they can be really critical and bring forward women's voices. And these sort of uh, voices that a lot of the reactionaries try to silence by all means uh, possible at the disposal, you know, labeling as Islamophobic, labeling as, you know, in a... In a unacceptable in society or no platforming of various kind and this is you know is a growing movement at the moment standing I'm saying we can't be silenced we will be heard and uh, you know that's that's such an important thing is at the age of you know at the, in the 21st century which we supposedly we have the greatest of the you know means of communication everywhere you know, the attempt to silence women, it's at the greatest and dangerous at the same yeah, time. Yeah, no, so. definitely. And I think, uh, you know, you will agree, I'm sure, with us that Sadia Hamid is a wonderful spokesperson for this cause and for this movement. Of course, she's also a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. And so, you know, very much part of Critical Sisters is the right to criticize religion. Uh, the fact that a criticism of religion is so key for human progress, you know, this is something we've spoken about before in the program as well. Um, Sadia does talk about the importance of challenging blasphemy, apostasy laws, at a time when you can be killed for it, threatened uh, because of it, but also because you're often charged with Islamophobia and other nonsense sort of accusations when you try to speak. And I think it fits in well with this campaign uh, against BBC Asian Network, for example, where, you know, its Islamist narrative is so normalized. Challenging it is what people like Saudi Hamid do, and that's really key, isn't it? Yeah, and I think uh, um, the whole uh, opposition... Um, against no platforming, restriction of freedom of expression, and actually having a forum to debate and discuss key issues, no matter how you know uncomfortable it is for uh, for some people, you know, Critical Sisters is one of those forums and platforms that is going to drive this forward, and we congratulate them for the launch of the organization and listen to this wonderful interview with Sadia. Hi, Sadia. It's lovely to have you on our program. Thank you for having me. I wanted to ask you about Critical Sisters. It was the launch today. Tell us why you launched it. We launched it because we realised that uh, all of the issues myself and Joe wanted to talk about are being dominated by the right or by the regressive left. So um, our voices were being silenced So in terms of talking about uh, religious fundamentalism or gender identity. Most of the conversations were being dominated by the, le uh, the regressive left or conservative right. 
Why do you think it's important to have another voice? Because you, you mentioned the fact that you're coming from the left as well. Mm -hmm. How is that important? Why is it important? The, the regressive left f have similar ideas and narratives as the conservative right, but they masquerade as the liberal left. But they, they work tirelessly to silence those that have differing views to them in the name of liberalism and in the name of left-wing politics. But actually they are far from left. They focus entirely on identity politics and not on the issues that are causing genuine harm. Why is um, identity politics not a good thing? Because we often hear about how progressive it is. Um, because it, that's all it reduces people down to, their identity, not their politics, not their social beliefs, or them as people. It focuses just on their ideas, as if ideas have, have feelings and their identities have feelings and we're going, that we're going to be harming them rather than their, the actual harm of the people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Why did you call your first event Unspeakable Women? Uh, the reason we called it Unspeakable Women was because all of the women that were speaking on our platform had been no platformed or attempts to silence them had been uh, made using petitions or uh, protests. Um, and it was important to us to, to give women that space back. Um, it feels like there is an even, even there's more so an attack on women speaking from the left than men from the left. Um, so you know the silencing of women has go gone on since the beginning of time, and for when when it happens from ex expected enemies uh, such as um, the conservative right or patriarchal leaders, then women know how to challenge that. But right now, because it's happening at the hands of left and the left and supposed allies, um, it felt really, really important to reclaim that space. What about uh, as someone who's an ex-Muslim, you talk about uh, how there's attempts to silence mm -hmm. those important issues as well. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's important to speak out as ex-Muslims? Because we have no support anywhere. Um, we are um, considered the enemy from within the communities that we were once part of, but we're also considered the enemies of those who we think are our allies, who we think are going to support us, like the, the left. And what about, what do you say to people who say that, why mention that you're ex-Muslim because it can be offensive to people, just get on with your life, don't tell people who you are? I don't think it's, uh, so it's not the central thing for me. If I'm telling somebody, a stranger, about myself, I would describe myself as a radical feminist and as an atheist or anti-theist actually. Um, but I think the the importance of talking about ex-Muslims is that if you were to line up an ex-Christian, an ex-Jew, an ex-Hindu, an ex-Buddhist, the only one that is likely to be murdered is the ex-Muslim. That's why it's important to shed light on that because although some people, when they leave their religion in other faiths, um, face ostrac uh, being ostracized, uh, being shunned by the community, um, the, in Islam, the, it is within the, the confines of Islam that you are required to murder somebody who is an ex-Muslim. So because of that, um, I feel like it's important to talk about it and challenge it. What do you say to people who say that you shouldn't offend, you shouldn't uh, um, disrespect people's beliefs? I'd say what you say. I'm offended all the time. I'm offended by the fact that within Islam you are allowed to marry a child. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that the penis of a fully grown man inserted into the vagina of a small child will either cause significant harm or kill her. You know, I, I'm offended that they, they are intolerant of um, homosexuals. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm offended that, um, that they... That they that they condone slavery, that they condone sex slaves, domestic abuse, rape. So 
I'm against all of this and I'm offended by it, but I don't prevent them from speaking. In fact, I think free speech is a wonderful thing. You know, um, we had um, Nick Griffin from the BNP go on television and humiliate himself. If we were continue, if we continue to stifle free speech, then we would never have found out about what he was really like. He would continuously be no platformed, we wouldn't know where, what he was like. And actually now, the BNP was so harmed because of that one interview, their, their membership is little to nothing now because of that one interview. So it's so crucial to, to have free speech so that if you have concerns about some ideas, they can be aired and it, you can see how ridiculous they are and you can ridicule them. But do you think um, you don't need to be concerned about some types of speech in order to protect minorities? No, I, 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 I would have no restrictions on free speech unless you know, somebody was stood telling you to, to kill people. But the concerning thing for me is, you know, when it comes to Islamists that s sit and talk about how homosexuals should be pushed off buildings, they, they, they talk about how you can harm women, you can have sex with children, that isn't considered hate speech. But when we want to talk about how we, th we find Islamism a problem, then we are prevented from speaking. And uh, finally, I mean, what, with Critical Sisters, what do you hope to do? And why this focus on women? The focus on women because I feel more and more that women are being silenced using different methods and historically there were, there were conservative um, sort of tools used to silence women but actually I feel like even the left now is working towards silencing women and preventing them from open, speaking publicly and openly. Um, so I, I felt like that was my sort of driving force for, for opening criticism. Yeah. And final question, <coughs> uh, just as a follow-up on that, is um, what exactly are you hoping to achieve with Critical Sisters? Um, we would like to um, give women their voices back. Um, we would like to challenge the no-platforming of women. And we would like to make uh, unsafe spaces <laughs> Uh, safe space is unsafe. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
in, in the last year and um, the you know reception by her fellow students just like amazing and that's what worries the like Islamists that. and the reactionaries but popular support for her is so immense even the Islamists said did we actually issue a fight? But it wasn't us, well, it actually. Wasn't us, who, no. who does this sort of mm. thing? We just wanted people not to go and get drunk and go crazy. It's like the BBC Asia Network, <laughs> isn't it? But the best response was her own, where she said, you know, I'm blessed with this voice. I'm going to carry on singing. And that's exactly the response that's that necessary. Deserves, and that's yeah. what makes it such a beautiful slice of life and something that's just so heartwarming. And we wanted to share that with you. Before we do that, we want to say goodbye. This brings us to the end of our program for this yeah. week. We hope you enjoyed this week's program and we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, goodbye. goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.